All right, so in chapter four, we're talking about hardware, software, and mobile systems. And we've kind of completed hardware and software. Okay, hardware and software, as you remember, is the, the computer side of the five component framework. You know, we talked about storage, we talked about, you know, it all comes down to one and zeros. We understood what the prefixes are. We talk about bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes. Important as a business professional, understand those kind of things. Uh, we talked about different types of applications, client-server applications, thin, thin client, thick client applications. We also talked about the types of software that we might run into. We talked about, you know, vertical means it's, it's in one industry, okay? it covers all, all aspects of one industry, horizontal, across multiple industries. And then we talked about one-of-a-kind applications. And most software and organizations, unless you are a software organization, is acquired, okay? Even if you are a software organization like Microsoft, Microsoft probably buys their payroll system software. They probably don't develop their own because it is known as horizontal software, right? So why should they develop their own when someone else does it? We, we said all this is possible because we can easily duplicate software. That's the beautiful thing about it. We can't easily duplicate a house. We can't easily duplicate any physical items. That may change with 3D printing, but Digital items we can easily, easily duplicate. So we talked about all these kinds of things. We talked about application software. We talked about uh, operating system software. Uh, we talked about open source. What does open source mean? Because that one, I don't know if you guys got that. What does open source mean? What is open source? If I say something is open source software, I compare it to what other type of software? Open source versus what? I wrote on the board. Ian? Proprietary means someone owns it, right? And they will they will lease you a license to it, right? That's open. They have it copyrighted, protected, if you will. It's theirs. So what's open source? What's the difference? And that's most are, most applications. You know, I developed it. I want to make money on it. I copyright it. What's open source? What's the difference there? What's open source? Go ahead, Ian. Anyone can use it. Yeah, we say you know what? We're gonna make the recipe, the source code, available to anyone. Plus, you can use it for whatever purpose you like, you can add to it, you can modify it, we're not trying to make money. Usually there's not one company behind it, it's a community of programmers, okay? So we talked in the business world, which one do we go with? You know, if we're, we're trying to roll out a new marketing system or a new payroll system, do we use the open source solution or do we use the proprietary system? And it says, we said it depends, right? And we gave a lot of reasons and rationales why we would use each of those, okay? So that's something we talked about. Um, so we talked about the advantages of thick client versus thin client applications. We say a lot of things are moving toward the thin client, okay, toward web-based solutions. And it kind of forays into what we're going to talk to the today, which you guys know intimately, is what is a mobile information system, okay? What is a mobile information system? How many of you guys went to the Daniel Levitin lecture? Daniel Levitin lecture, okay? What was his whole deal? What was his theme, if you will. What was his theme, if you will? Well, give me one theme from his little lecture. Okay, he talked about the way the mind works, and what did he say about multitasking? Is that, um, it's not sorry, your brain can only focus on like a couple of things at a time. Right, and multitasking is really like called, like switching, right? You're just switching real quick, right? You're switching your attention real quick, so it looks like you can do something. What else did he talk about? What else did he talk about? Is it getting worse or better? Worse. Worse, right? Why? Because we're trying to do more things at once. And why? What is one of the things leading us that way? And, and I'm included in this. I'm probably, for my generation, I'm probably the worst example of this. Okay? One of the worst examples of this. Right, mobile devices, right? The fact that we're always on because we have a mobile device tied to us. We're always available, right? We're always there to see what's going on and check out things going on Facebook and Vine and all those kind of things, right? I guess Vine is dead, but yik yak, whatever it might be, okay? All these things we're checking out, you know, all the time, right? So, so if you think about it, okay, and I don't know if you guys remember, who asked the questions that were really concerned about that? What, what, what kind of people? I don't remember the questions. Wow, the two older ladies, they were like, oh, what's wrong with these young people? <laughs> they were, they were very concerned about you, like, oh my goodness, weren't they? Both of them, there's two questions. They were basically like saying, please, like, I don't know, you know, tell that generation they're wrong. So anyways, this is something that is happening in the world. 
And we're going to talk a little bit about today's advantages and disadvantages of this. So first, let's talk about what a mobile information system is. Okay? The first thing, the big key word there is mobile. Okay? We have that mobility. We have users in motions given that they have a mobile device, whether it be a smartphone, whether it be a laptop, whether it be a tablet, whether it be a smart watch, right, or anything. Okay? Something that is in motion, something that is portable and like you is very mobile. It needs, if it's mobile, right, it can't be hardwired. It can't go through an ethernet. You're not plugging in. I guess it can be, but that really kind of takes away the mobility of it all, right, if you need a hookup. So there has to be some kind of wireless connectivity. And if you think about it, what provides that in an information system? In wireless, what, what provides that wireless connectivity in the information system? What provides that? Come on, you guys know. In most cases, what? Right now, if you're connected, you're using what? Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, okay? And that is a standard called 802.11. And it's, there's different versions, different flavors of that, but you're using 802.11 protocol. Okay, there's A, B, G, N. Uh, you're using 802.11 to connect with that access point that's on the top of the ceiling, which is hardwired into our network, right? And if you move to somewhere else in SCOTUS, you're hooking up to another access point. So now if we're, we're near a wired campus, and we're a wired campus, right, we're always connected. But that's not good enough, right? Because sometimes we're not at St. Francis University. Sometimes we're not at our home. So what is the other way we connect? What is the other big wireless standard? Okay, so we talk about cellular connectivity, yes? All right, so 4G, 3G, the various flavors of that. Okay, we can also talk about the, but I'm not gonna, that's for another chapter. So wireless connectivity. So wireless connectivity connected to what? That's the key. What is the thing we're connecting to? What is the, so we know we have these devices, these hardware devices with software on them, and we talk about the data, wireless connectivity. What are we connecting to? Why is it so robust and so powerful? What are we connecting to? What are we connecting to? What aren't we connecting to is a better question, right? What we're connecting to is what we call the cloud, right? And a cloud, like I'd say three, four years ago was the buzzword, right? The cloud was the buzzword, but to the cloud. That was the buzzword, now it's kind of old school. Now probably the biggest buzzword is like big data is a big buzzword. You guys hear big data? Okay, that's kind of a buzzword now. But cloud was the buzzword. What is a cloud? Well, the cloud, if you see over here my cloud drawing, this is probably as good as the PowerPoint, is, is basically meant to say, I don't know where it's at, right? It, it, is, it is the internet. It's the cloud. I don't know where it's at. It could be a server in Germany. It could be a server in Loretto. It could be a server in Arizona. I don't know, but I'm connecting to resources in the cloud. This internet, and that's why they draw as a cloud, because we don't know where it's at, right? Google has server farms all over the world, okay? So doing a Google, we're Googling something, we may be connecting to the server, you know, probably, probably in this region, because that makes it faster, but Northern Virginia is probably where it's at. Okay, so websites, services, application code, and data sources is what we're connecting to in the cloud. So let's think about this. This has, more so than anything else, okay, change the way that business works and society works in the last five, 10 years. No doubt, okay, no doubt. You guys are different than students I taught five years ago because of the more prevalence of, 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 of cell phones. I'm different than, than I was five years ago. The way I do business, the way I interact with students, the way I interact with my, my, my family, right, is different, okay? So let's analyze this using the five component framework. Okay, let's take that, let's do that together. Let's analyze this trend using the five component framework. And I want to try to answer, hey, what is the impact of mobile systems growth as, as viewed through these five components? So help me out with this. Hardware, software, data, procedures, and people. Give me one, give me one that this impact of mobile systems has changed? Give me one, and, and why? Hardware, software, Matt, thank you, Matt. Matt's always willing to speak, and I love that about you, Matt. Go Hardware ahead, Matt. It could be like smaller, smaller devices. Oh. Uh, like just think of cell phones. Okay. When they first came out, uh, they were either connected to your car. Or so where would we put that, Matt? On the, on the five component framework, you're right, smaller devices 
and more of them, yes? More of them. So where would we put that? The devices themselves are? Okay, right, so very good. So we're gonna say more devices and more portable devices, yes? And he's right, they're smaller, they're in more things, right? You can, you can have Wi-Fi enabled almost anything, right? Your, your, your thermostat, if you ever heard the company Nest, can be Wi-Fi enabled. Your house is gonna have lighting systems, your HVAC system, your air conditioning. It's all going to be, you know, connected, okay? So that's one thing. The hardware, this has become ubiquitous, right? This has become, everyone has a smartphone. If I asked five years ago how many people had a smartphone, it'd be one or two students. And now every, I, I, I'm guessing it's almost 100% here, right? Even my son who's 14, it's 100% among his age group. My son that's 12, it's probably 75% among his age group. My son that's 10, it's probably 50% among his age group. My son doesn't, my, only my 14 year old has a smartphone. But anyways, okay. So that is definitely true about hardware. What else? What else about software? Go ahead, what, whatever, Plama, you take it. Limits of the software because no other application that you can use that you can use in the past. Okay, so you're right. So let's think about the impact of mobile devices to software. So. What are the things different about the mobile interface as compared to, you know, when you're sitting at your computer, you know, and you, you've got a, you got a monitor, what, what, you're, you're right, things are different, what, how is it different though, you're right, go ahead, Christina. I was going to say that there's a special form that they'll do for your phone rather than just like the straight internet version. Okay, so very much so, we have, we have mobile versions of uh, websites, yes, mobile versions of websites. And in truth, you know, you can go to the website, but at many times we prefer not just to use the, the mobile version of the website, like go to www.dell.com you know, or www.tdameritrade.com, but what is the, the special version that's been developed so you can interact with your bank, so you can inter interact with TD Ameritrade, you can interact with Amazon, what do we call that, Plama? Okay, the app, right? The app, mobile versions or applications. And these things allow it to be scalable. So what do you notice? And this is kind of forwarding into, into some of our uh, future slides. But what do you notice about these mobile interfaces? What do you notice about these mobile interfaces? And by the way, two terms I'm going to throw out right now that, that aren't on the slides here. But UI and UX, okay? You know what those stand for? And you should know the acronym. What's UI stand for? User interface. Very good. UI stands for user interface. And it used to be, you hear the term GUI. Do you ever, remember, did you ever hear GUI? No? GUI meant, this was when it was new, it was called graphical user interface. When, when you first interacted with a computer via touching things and clicking on buttons, that was called a graph. It used to be all text-based, right? When I first went to the internet, it was very much, I typed, something came back that was text-based, okay? That was in 1992. Now it's graphical, okay? So UI stands for user interface. How we interface with this, okay? Do we click on something? Do we, is there a drop-down? What is UX then? User experience. Very good. UX is user experience. So it is the sum total of how we interact with this thing. Not just the interface, but what is our experience? And, and you think about Apple, you know, the only ones that, that try to you know, change the user experience. They try to simplify the user experience so that it's seamless, okay? So how do they do this? What are some things in the software when they're talking about mobile versions that they do to improve the mobile user interface, the user experience? What are things that we do? And it's gonna pour into future, another slide, but what are some things we do? What don't you see on apps that you see when you go to the full version on the website? What don't you see a lot of times? Come on. What don't you see? What's that? Pop-ups. What do you mean by pop-ups? Uh, like on the internet, you can you click on something and a pop-up with like ads would pop up or something. But okay. Um, All right. So. A couple things, all right, I see what you're saying. You have limited real estate. So you think about it, when you look at a website, there's a lot of navigation stuff around, right? There's a lot of like top of the top that says, hey, this is how we navigate, maybe stuff on the left, left navigation, right? And maybe you think about even 
uh, you know, if you're interfacing with something, it has, it has menus and stuff like that. Do you guys know what I'm saying? What we call that in application, applications is like, we call it Chrome, okay? Chrome is the stuff that goes around the application. It's not the content, okay? It's all the stuff that goes around that you use to navigate it, right? So web application, I'm sorry, like applications, mobile versions, don't have a lot of Chrome, so how do you interact with it? How do you interact with it? Instead of going to like, all right, I'm gonna click on here and then go drop down on there, you know, with your mouse and you know, those kind of things. How do you interact with it? Usually it's a scaled down version. Go ahead, Pablo. Okay, we call that direct interaction. Okay, direct interaction. You don't really have to be told what to do. You just touch it, you say, okay, I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna go here, you know, transfer money for my account, click here, right? And then you hit boom, boom, boom. You don't, there's no instructions around it. You directly interact with it, right? It's not told. And in fact, we also talk about, when we talk about that interface, we talk about it having context savvy, or context, uh, it's not savvy, it's not the right word, uh, context sensitive interface. What do you think that means, a context-sensitive interface? What do you think a context-sensitive interface is? You guys, who knows me for, for stats right now? Dominic does, right? What happens in, in Excel when we click on the graph? What becomes available that wasn't available there? Yeah, right, we have the graph tools, yes? And if we click on the pivot table, now we have pivot tool. That is an example of context-sensitive, right? It knows what you're trying to do, so it changes your display based on what you're trying to do, right? It's very what they call intuitive. It's trying to think what you're trying to do, yes? So a couple of things. Good user interface, okay, when we talk about software, features content and supports direct interaction. We talked about that. Uses context-sensitive Chrome when needed. Chrome, like I said, is like the navigational stuff. It's not the content stuff. It's the stuff that helps us get through it. You might see that like, you know, if you, you click on something that says, hey, did you mean to click on this? It's like a pop-up, but it, it's very context sensitive. It provides animation and lively behavior. I think that's true of a good website as well, but you know, even more so when we're talking about an application. It's designed to scale and share display and data, okay? It's designed to scale and share. So what do they mean by share? What do they mean by share? It, it makes it real easy to share. What, what are some things we see that makes it easy to share. Like I'm, I'm looking at content somewhere and I want to share it with Earl or I want to share it with Katie. Go ahead. You just click on it and like an option pops up. Okay. We call those things, well, like in Microsoft's case, Microsoft Windows 8, they call them charms, okay? They call them little charms because they, they have, and you see this even with like the newest version of Microsoft Office, you know, if you look at a graph, it has those three little things on the edge, you know, 2013. Those are called charms. They allow for direct inter interaction, uh, and, 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 and they allow you to share, and they use the cloud, and I think that makes sense. But some examples, okay, some examples. This is Windows 8, which I think most of you guys have right now. It is a Chrome-less interface, meaning there's nothing there that says, you know, click start, then go to file, then go to programs, right? It says, hey, if you want to go to Kindle, click on Kindle. You don't have to be told. If you want to go to Firefox, click on. It's a direct interaction interface. It's called Chromeless, right? More and more applications move to that. This is an example of good scaling, right? It looks the same on your laptop as it looks on your tablet, as it looks on your smartphone, right? So this is an example of scaling. Uh, this is an example of a charm. We're looking at this web page and we want to mail it to Jane Kim. You know, we click on the charm. This is an example of sharing. Uh, this is also something that goes along with the cloud, and we'll talk about the cloud in a minute. Uh, but when we use the cloud, well, let's, let's, let's come back to that, okay? Because I'm not done with this one. All right, so good. We talked about software. Those are some of the things that go along with software. What else? Well, we're still talking about the impact of mobile systems growth. So, go ahead, Kate. Uh, well, I was going to say people have become like, a lot more dependent yeah. on Yeah, very good, okay? We think about people, okay? Remember, this is the most important component of any information system, and that 
also applies to mobile information systems, right? So we could probably think about a lot of advantages and disadvantages to people, right? To people because of the impact of mobile information systems. So Katie kind of put up a, I'd say an advantage and a disadvantage at once. She says, you know, we've become reliant upon it. Okay, we come, become reliant upon it because it's so damn useful, right? Like, I'd rather forget my wallet than my smartphone. You know, you guys at, at that point, remember your, your wallet or your purse, whatever it was, was a, now my smartphone is the thing, like if I, if I could have one thing in my pocket, it would be my smartphone, right? That is the thing I become reliant upon, okay? So that's a, that's a good and a bad thing. What else? So let's, let's think about people. How has it impacted people? Yes, Katie. Uh, well, we've kind of had to think less, too, because like, oh, you can just look it up and, instead of thinking about the answer. Okay. Did you say it's a, a positive or a negative? Uh, both. I'd say it as well, right? I think I love the fact that information is at my fingertips, right? I love the fact that I'm in an argument I, I, or whatever. We're talking about something and I want to know more. Someone used a word I don't understand. Boom, I can look it up. I love that, right? And I and sometimes get lost in Wikipedia holes, right? You ever do that? Like you get in Wikipedia and then you go deeper and deeper and deeper. And you're like, holy shit, I just wasted two hours. You know, just studying something that means nothing in my life, right? So the, the, the access at, to information at your fingertips, to info at your fingertips, uh, has caused maybe maybe like a loss of you know the ability to do research those kind of things because you know Google knows this why do I need to know Google so so we'll say access uh, almost unlimited access to info um, you know good and bad you know I don't even like when my son has a game somewhere I don't even know where the stadium is I get in the car and go I'm like I'll figure it out right on the way I'll, uh, and sometimes we go to these places like. You know, shade, they don't have internet. You know, they don't have any 4G. And I'm like, oh man, I should have looked this up before I left, right? So, so good and bad. What else? What are some other things? Now think about what Daniel Levinson said. What What are some disadvantages? What's What's the What Daniel Levinson said? Yes. It makes us multitask. Okay, it makes us, you know, very much our fragmented our attention. It has fragmented our attention, right? Now, that is, this is some bad things, right? But what, what is the beautiful things about this? You know, we, we kind of, you know, they're kind of focusing on the bad things. You know, and I, 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 I heartily agree. This has done all this to me, right? I, I'm a, you know, but what, why, what are the good things? Did I think over, overwhelm the bad things? What are the good things? What are the good things? Katie. <laughs> Um, it's like a personal more. conversation. Like it's, it's almost as like you and I are in my office. And go ahead. Um, it lets us know more, so we can kind of like if we want to know more, we have the option of looking it up. Okay, so it made us smarter, right? What there's there, we'll study later something called expert systems. Expert systems are it takes a business professional or you know a medical professional, or whatever, and they may not know everything, but if they have an expert system, they can be perceived to be an expert, right? And it's kind of the same true of me and you, right? We may not be an expert, but because of that access to information in our hands, you know, we can have some expertise. What about productivity? Matt, what, what were you going to say? I'm sorry. What were you going to say? It does make you probably more productive to say something along the lines of productivity because you're always able to say answer, call, answer, email. Okay. Good and bad, right? Good and bad. The fact that you're, like, always on. That's a good thing, right? There's sometimes... Where things you can resolve them very quickly, you can respond to that email at 10 p.m. at night and not deal with it the next morning. You know, some people say that's a bad thing. You know, I do those kind of things. Uh, you can be on uh, the golf course, maybe you know, closing a business deal, and also be like you're in your office, right? You could be responding to email or you know, checking out the, the the market or whatever you might be doing, right? So in a lot of ways, it has increased productivity in a lot of ways, right? In a lot of ways. It has increased productivity. If, if not, it would not be you know, so prevalent in the business world, right? If, if it was, didn't increase productivity, you know, businesses would ban them. They'd say, no, don't bring your cell phone to work, or don't bring, you know, they, they would ban them, but they don't, right? They, they actually hand them out. They give them to people. They say, hey, we're, we want you connected, so here's a Blackberry, here's an iPhone, here's whatever it is, okay? Um, you know, my, my, my brother is a manager of the Lowe's store in State College. 
Every, every manager of a Lowe's store gets an iPad and an iPhone, the latest iPad and an iPhone. Now, it's, you know, it's, it's Lowe's. It's not like it's, it's a, you know, an Apple store or technology store, but they realize it makes him more productive, right? He can go look at inventory on the fly when he has a customer complaint, he has a customer relationship management system right on his hip. You know, those kind of things, they know it makes you more productive. So that's why they give those things out, okay? Um, so that would kind of go, some of that kind of stuff would go with procedures as well. You know, there, there's, a, there's a talk about, you know, when are you in the office and when are you not in the office? This can also get you in trouble. Like you, you maybe you're, you know, if you're not, you know, maybe it's a Friday night, Saturday night, and someone sends you an email and you quit back and you, that's not something you would have done in the office, but hey, you were in a different mode, different context. So we got to think about, you know, the hybrid of personal and professional lives. How about data? Let's talk about data. What about data? What about data? More or less data. Pablo, go ahead. A lot more data. A lot more data, right? A lot more data being generated every single second of every single day. How about day 11? What did he say about data? He actually used a term we used in this class, and I was very pleased. What was the term he used when he talked about the amount of information being created? How many went to day 11? What was, what was the byte term he used? It was a really big one. Yeah, he used exabyte, right? You guys remember he used exabyte? I think he, I think he kind of butchered it, too. I, I remember something he said was wrong. And I, don't know, I kind of cringed a little bit. I can't remember what it was, though. That terrible memory. But what do you say about exabyte? That we're using like a lot more than just that. Yeah, the, in the last, I think he said, if I'm, if I'm not, if I'm not for, if I'm not wrong, I think he said in the last five years, didn't we create over 300 exabytes of information, right, through interactions, 300 exabytes, which is, you know, he said 317 zeros, I think that's right. Okay, we had created 300 exabytes of information. And then he said, in the last five years that was, and in all of humanity, from five years back, we didn't create five exabytes, I think is what he said. Do you guys remember that? So think about a lot more. Yeah, a hell of a lot more, right? A hell of a lot more. You just think about the amount of data that you create after in a day, okay? Just and you're just one person. The amount of data, like, and, and not only things that you passively creating data. When you buy things, you know, when you take your car through the turnpike, you're creating data. You know, when you get a when you take a class, you're creating data. When you're when you're moving around, your smartphone is tracking that data. Where's Katie? Right? Katie's here. You know, then the month Google reports how much I walk. For God's sake, they know where I went. They predict where where I'm going. Right? They say, oh, you're, it's it's 4:30. You're probably heading home. It's 18 minutes. Home. It's kind of funny because I go like on back roads, but it like predicts the traffic on my you know on my on my path, which doesn't make very much sense for me. But they're predicting that, right? They know what I'm doing, right? So every day. Google is collecting tons of information just on me because of the device in my pocket. So more and more data can lead to more information. Here's, here's a great example of how businesses are using data, okay? Uh, and this is an advertising example. My wife and I, our kitchen light broke like two years ago, okay? Our kitchen light broke like two years ago. Did I tell this story? I told this story, I don't know if I'm telling you. Did I tell this story? Uh, yeah. Mother was like on Facebook. Yes. All right. I told this story. Same story. Repeat it. All right. In your head. It must. Did anyone else remember besides Annie? Yeah. Yeah. Must not have been a good story then. If only Annie remembered. It. Now I'm not telling it again. Okay. Um, all right. So okay. So that's good. We talked about those five components. Now we can also talk about the quality of what we were experience. We talked about those things. All right. So we have an understanding of those things. I think I went through this. Let's talk about the cloud a little bit. And there's a whole chapter dedicated to networks and the cloud. Three years ago when I taught this class, the chapter was called networks. Now it's called networks and the cloud because the cloud is what we're trying to network to, right? This thing, this nebulous thing called the internet and the cloud. So let's think about, okay, let's think about the cloud, all right? So what are things in the cloud that we want to get access to? We want to get access to text, email, other services, extend applications on the servers. So one of the benefits of using the cloud is I don't care what kind of processing power I have in my phone, 
I know if I can get to the cloud, the cloud has unlimited processing power, you know, for all test purposes. So if I have some kind of request that requires a lot of processing power, my phone can send it to the cloud, it can be processed and it can be sent back to me, right? That's one of the benefits of the cloud. The cloud can also connect me to every single person in the world, right? Instantly, that's what social networks are all about. That's what email, text, other service, other communication services are about. What is roaming? This kind of goes along with mobile information systems. What is roaming? You guys ever hear the concept of roaming? Not like roaming in a cell phone like, hey, I'm out of my, my uh, area, so it's in roam mode, but roaming across devices. Have you ever started watching a movie on one thing, one device, one place, maybe you're watching on your phone, then you went home and said, well, I don't want to use my phone anymore because I have this TV screen, and I started watching Netflix on my TV screen. Does it start at the beginning? No. It knows where the hell you were, right? It knows where you were, you're on, you're like, you're binge watching a series of Breaking Bad. It knows, hey, you're on, you know, episode, you're on season five, episode five, and you're 35 minutes in. It's because that's on the cloud, right? It's not on your device. It doesn't store, hey, you were, you know, you, you were on episode five, season three, whatever, 30 minutes in on your phone. It's stored in the cloud. So that's what roaming is, right? You can, you can be working on something, not, now that's Netflix is a silly example, but you can be working on something, you know, in the airport, you fly across the country, you pick up, it says, here's where you left off, okay? Boom, that's called roaming. And the cloud allows us to roam, you know, <coughs> as we do things. Uh, data and news, push and pull, push and pull. Um, we talked about push and pull when we talked a little bit about uh, chapter one, we talked about getting information. What's, what's push versus pull? We already defined this, I know. Yes? One, um, it's like information that's automatically sent to you. And that's push information, pull information is like what you see down. Okay, so push and pull, pull is exactly what we seek out. We request this data, like if I wanted to, at this point, see how many cell phone minutes I use this month, that would be pull. Give me an example of how we use the cloud for push data. Go ahead. It would be emails. Like, you know how like, you have your email like, directly uh, set up to your iPhone or Android? Okay, so yeah, that would, be, that would be an example of connecting to an application, but give me some information that was pushed to you that you're like, what the hell? Like it almost predicted it for you. Go ahead, Katie. Well, I know everyone has an iPhone. Yeah. They put YouTube put their album in your cloud. Like it's not on my phone because I don't have the music that's like on my cloud on my right. phone. Right. They like everyone that has an iPhone, it's in their cloud on their phone, like through Apple. Okay, very good. So we're going to talk. You're right. We're going to talk about some of the things with well, let's speak about the cloud. So. When we talk about Apple and the cloud, Apple got in trouble with the cloud. Why are they in trouble with the cloud? A little bit. Yeah, uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. They, uh, you know, it keeps coming out. All these celebrities uh, have these 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 inappropriate, you know, not inappropriate for them, but inappropriate to be displayed publicly pictures. And what happened is, you know, a lot of times their their pictures and stuff were automatically backed up to the cloud. Well, now it's no longer on your device, right? It's on the cloud, and if someone says, hey, I got your password, and, and they say, I want to I want to restore my iPhone, my iPhone was wrecked, and they have your user ID and password, well, they can they can go to the cloud and, and restore all of your stuff onto their phone, now they have it, right? So that's a bad thing. So you're right. What's kind of nice about the cloud in one way is that I don't have to have unlimited storage on this device because I can store things like song, music, uh, Word documents, spreadsheets in the cloud. Yes? Okay. Um, how about push? As, and we talk about context sensitive push. Then everyone got a notification on their phone, and you're like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, that, that's exactly what I was thinking of. No? Anyone use Google Now? Okay. Rodrigo, what's Google Now show you? What else? Where I parked. Where you parked, which is nice, right? Because you're thinking about, and where the hell did I park, right? Like if I look at, I don't know if this is going to work, but, you know, if I have an Android device, and I do, okay, and there's, there's many devices like this, but if I use, okay, Google Now, 
Whoops. I don't know if you guys can see this. Um, but if I hit my Google Now button, it says, hey, you know, here's all your stocks, right? And those are things that I set up. These are the things I set up. These are the stocks that I watch. So I set that up. But I didn't ask to see Tappy's to host charity golf outing, right? I didn't ask to see that, that article, but it was pushed to me. Why was it pushed to me? Because you're around here. Well, I'm around here, and what else? I've been on the Troubadour before. You know, I maybe have looked at things with, you know, this, this is a, a Penguins article. I didn't ask to see this Penguins article. I don't care about, well, I, I probably won't read that. But it pushed it to me because it knows I'm interested in the Pittsburgh Penguins. It knows that I've gone to those kind of sites before. Uh, it knows that I'm interested in the Pirates. I'm really interested in the Pirates. Uh, it also knows, you know, there's some more Pirates things. Um, it also can do things like, it looks at my Gmail, and if I have a hotel reservation for later tonight in Boston, it shows that there, and it says, hey, you have X hours to get to Boston, and by the way, here's your confirmation code, here's the address, and here's directions there. I didn't ask for that to be sent to me. Do you guys know what I'm saying? Google said, hey, we saw this in your email. We saw this confirmation come through for this hotel for the night. How about I push that out to you at this time, right? When, it, when it's useful to you, yes? Plain tickets, have you seen this? Rodrigo does this for you. That's an example of using the cloud to push information. I have some shopper applications as well. And those are, I'm going to, I use Retail Me Not. You guys ever hear Retail Me Not? What's Retail Me Not? It's a great site. I agree with that. Yeah. So before you buy anything online, you guys almost see that coupon code box at the bottom? And sometimes you have something to put in there, sometimes you don't. But we don't have the information on all the available coupon codes, but Retail Me Not is an aggregator of information. You go out to Retail, retail Me Not and say, I'm shopping on, I don't know, Dick's Sporting Goods. It'll tell you what the current coupon codes are. And usually, I mean, I find one typically 10, 15, 20% off, and that's saving money is better than making money, right? So I save money. Uh, but anyways, I installed that application on it, and Retail Me Not says, like, if I'm in, I don't know, the Altoona area, it's like, hey, there's a special at this store or whatever it is. It's context sensitive. So uh, it's pushing information. I really don't want that information pushed to me. But that's an example of push information in the cloud. Uh, this is an example of roaming. You're currently on page 22. This is like a Kindle, uh, Kindle thing on Kelly's iPhone. Uh, go to that page, yes. Um, I can't see what you're doing. Oh, okay. You can only see my phone, huh? So this is an example of roaming. Okay, sync the furthest page. I think we've seen that. It can be with all kinds of things, not just entertainment things like movies and music and, and books, but it can also be with documents we're working on. Now, the last thing in Chapter 4 uh, that we're going to talk about, and we have like seven minutes, so I guess we can knock this out. We can talk about the challenges of personal mobile devices at work. And there's a big thing about what they call uh, uh, personal devices at work policies. Uh, trying to think, bring your own, BYOD it's called. BYOD is bring your own device, okay, I guess it's kind of cutesy. BYOD policies, bring your own device policies. And there's a lot of organizations that have policies around that, okay. We really don't have, we do have a policy, but it's a very open policy at St. Francis, which I think it should be, right. We're allowed to bring our own device and connect it to the network, right. I'm, I, my Android phone is connected to the network under the employee thing. Uh, you may have devices that you bring from home that are connected to our network, right? I think it makes sense. So a lot of, a lot of places fight this, right? They, 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 they try to figure out, hey, how do we make it open and yet still have control? Because the advantage is, okay, employees are more satisfied, uh, higher productivity, reduced support costs. But let's talk about the disadvantages. What's the disadvantages of mobile devices at workplaces? Yes? Okay, you can't control it, right? Distractions, right? It, it used to be, you could see like, hey, Mary Jane is screwing off because she's on the phone chatting with her girlfriend, or you know, maybe Bob is screwing off because he's been talking at the water cooler for 45 minutes. But now, you can be what, virtually screwing off, yes, for, for a long time. The other thing that goes along with that, okay, the other thing that goes along with that is a lot of times, say I'm working on something, and maybe it has all my students in a file, it has all their grades and all their social security numbers, right? 
So if it's a St. Francis, pretty secure, right? We have IT services staff securing the network. But if I download it to my tablet, because I want to work on it at home, and my tablet's stolen, guess what happens? So is, information. so is your information, right? And that is, now, someone has your name, someone might have your address, someone has your social security number, boom, identity theft, right? And you've seen these big stories about credit card companies losing information. 99 out of 100 times, that's how that information is lost. It's not people break into their system, it's because they downloaded it to a mobile device and then someone lost a laptop or someone lost a, a smartphone that had personal sensitive information in. Uh, risk of infection can be a problem, compatibility problems, that's not a big deal. Uh, data loss or damage is a big deal. <coughs> all right, so that's all I'm gonna talk about in chapter four. Uh, I would like you to take chapter four quiz by next Monday. You can take it twice. I'll keep the highest score. It's timed, 45 minutes, 20 mobile choice. Um, you know, you can use your book, understand your book, I, I, but it's, I want you to kind of become more familiar with, uh, with the information. Uh, we're going to move on next class, next Wednesday. We're going to move to chapter five, and we're going to talk about kind of the middle. Remember we talked about hardware, software. We're going to talk about data, okay? And we talk about data, where, are da where is data stored in organizations? In what type of the thing? Server, what do we call the, the warehouse of data, I guess? A database, okay? We're gonna talk about databases and databases, database hierarchy. Uh, we're actually gonna use, you guys ever use Microsoft Access? How many people use Microsoft Access? Two or three, okay. So we're gonna do a little application exercise where we use Microsoft Access so we can envision how databases work, all right? So have a fantastic day. I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you.